After the Diamondbacks made a franchise-changing move to acquire Randy Johnson, he would give them one of the greatest returns on investment by taking home four Cy Youngs in his first four seasons. So let's look at those four dominant seasons amidst the toughest era for pitchers. Totally sports task. Major League. After not signing with the Braves out of high school, Randy Johnson spent two years at USC, where he played baseball with Mark McGuire and basketball with Bronny James. Then he went on an expansion team tour. He was drafted by a team created in 1969 in the Montreal Expos in 1985, and made his debut three years later, making four starts in September, going 3-0 with a 2.42 ERA. But that didn't continue into 1989, as in his seven starts, he went 0-4 with a 6.67 ERA, walking nearly four batters a game. And with this, he was traded to a team formed in 1977 in the Seattle Mariners. And one thing he kept consistent was the hard time he had throwing strikes. He led the American League in walks from 1990 to 1992, but still had a K per 9 over 10 in 91 and 92. And facing Randy Johnson is already intimidating enough, but considering in his younger years not even he knew where his pitches were going, that made the experience even less fun. Obviously Johnson had insane potential, but had not reached it yet. And someone who noticed this and changed the trajectory of his entire career was Nolan Ryan. Ryan recommended that Johnson land on the ball of his foot when he delivered a pitch, as Johnson had been landing on his heel, often offline from the plate. And this little fix was huge for him, and the numbers support it. In 1993, his walks per nine went from 6.2 down to 3.5, and this resulted in an all-star appearance after compiling a 3.24 ERA and the highest K per nine in the league at 10.9, ultimately giving him a second place finish in Cy Young voting. And in a shortened 1994, he would end up finishing third after compiling a 3.19 ERA and 204 strikeouts in 172 innings pitching more complete game shutouts than he did the year prior at four and 12 less games. And though we will never know how 1994 would end up for him, 1995 gives you the idea. In the most important season of Mariners history, Johnson was a major part of it. He went 18-2 while leading the league in ERA at 2.48, while also leading the league in strikeouts, ERA+, FIP, WAR, and WHIP, easily giving him his first Cy Young, something that would eventually become the standard. He was injured for most of 1996 and will pitch two and a half more seasons for the Mariners after his Cy Young season, with 1997 giving him another second place Cy Young finish after leading the league in winning percentage and K per nine. And with the Mariners falling out of contention in 1998, Johnson was traded just before the deadline, this time joining a team formed in 1962 in the Houston Astros. He pitched just 11 games for the Astros, going 10-1 with a 1.28 ERA to help them win the division as he finished 7th in NL Cy Young voting after pitching just 11 games. And after that, he was a free agent. Naturally, everyone was interested in him, and it eventually narrowed down to the Rangers, Astros, Diamondbacks, Angels, and Dodgers. After making their pitches, it narrowed down to the Dodgers and Diamondbacks. And in the end, Johnson liked the straightforwardness of the Diamondbacks, who were willing to give him perks, such as he's to Suns games, prestigious golf club memberships, and great benefits for his family. And with this, he chose a team in their second year of existence in the Arizona Diamondbacks, signing for $52.4 million over four years, with a fifth-year option, and a $500,000 bonus for winning the Cy Young that would double with every additional Cy Young he won. And well, he took full advantage of that section of the contract. The 1999 Diamondbacks are simply one of the most out-of-nowhere teams of all time. Something that seems to happen whenever Johnson joins a team is that he helps them. Johnson had a bit of control problems in his first few starts as a Diamondback, but settled in after April, making the All-Star team with a 2.95 ERA at the break, with all but three of his first 20 starts, seeing him strike out at least eight. And that continued into the second half, where he was somehow better. He threw 15 games in the second half, compiling a 1.89 ERA, averaging 10 strikeouts a game. He ended the year with the same ERA as his 1995 season at 2.48, leading the league. He also led the league in complete games, with two of those being shutouts, which went a long way in him leading the league in innings pitched. He also led the league in strikeouts at 364, while also leading in FIP, WHIP, and WAR, which helped him win the Cy Young in a pretty close vote over Mike Hampton, as he became the third pitcher to win the Cy Young in both leagues. And funny enough, both him and Pedro Martinez completed this feat in the same season, as only Gaylord Perry had done it before him. And the most notable part of the year was how much of a workhorse he was. When he faced Nolan Ryan in 1993 after giving him career-changing advice, he threw 160 pitches in that game, and multiple games in 1999 saw him reach close to that count. The least amount of pitches he threw in a game that year was 93, in seven innings in a rare instance where he didn't walk anyone. The second least was 105, with nine games seeing him throw over 130 pitches to finish with an average of 120 per game. 
That incredible amount of work in his performance was perhaps the biggest reason the Diamondbacks had the biggest turnaround of any expansion team, finishing last with 65 wins in 1998, then winning 100 games in 1999. Of course, they had a great offense led by Luis Gonzalez, but Johnson led the team in war over Gonzalez by 2.2 points. They faced the mess in the NLDS, and Johnson pitched 8.1 innings in Game 1 with 11 strikeouts, but he gave up 7 earned runs, as they went on to lose to the Mets in 4 in their first ever playoff series. As things turned to the 21st century, the Diamondbacks could not follow up their great season with another one, but Randy Johnson could. His first half was even better than the previous year, as in 19 starts, he compiled a 1.8 ERA in 144.2 innings, striking out 193 as he started the All-Star game for the second time in his career, just two days after throwing 121 pitches in a 7-inning, 13-strikeout performance. He wasn't as good after the All-Star break, as his second half ERA was double of that in the first half but he still had a dominant year, putting up a 2.65 ERA as he once again led in strikeouts, ERA+, FIP, and WAR. And once again, this was enough to take home the Cy Young, bringing his Cy Young bonuses up to 1.5 million. And ultimately, I think this was his worst year of these four seasons, which is saying a lot. And talking about a season in the midst of the stretch is similar to the Diamondbacks in themselves. 85 wins in the third year of a franchise isn't bad at all, but winning 100 games the year prior will raise expectations, in part leading to Buck Showalter's firing. Johnson and Luis Gonzalez led the team in war in 1999 and 2000, but in 2000, Johnson nearly doubled the total. But with a few additions, the Diamondbacks would be right back into position as Johnson would have his most notable year. And probably the most memorable moment of the year in his entire career came before the season even started. On March 24th, in a spring training game against the Giants, a dove tragically lost its life when it was struck by a Randy Johnson fastball that was called a no pitch. Even after having one of the greatest careers a pitcher's ever had, Johnson has said this is the moment he's most asked about though the Dove's mother never got to ask him any questions. But two weeks after the defining moment of his career, the 2001 season began with a win over the Dodgers. And after a horrid second game against the Cardinals, as Song gave up nine earned runs, his ERA was at 7.82. And as you may guess, it would go down from there. It took six starts to lower his ERA under four, and in his seventh start, he made history, as he became the third pitcher to strike out 20 in a game, as he did so against the Reds on May 8th to top his own record of 19, which he did so twice in 1997. But since this game went to extras, he doesn't technically share the record for most strikeouts in a nine-inning game, although he pitched nine innings that game. Either way, the historic performance led him to another all-star start as his ERA was at 2.71 at the break. And in his second start after the break, he had another historic performance in an interesting case. On July 19th, a game against the Padres at Qualcomm Stadium was stopped after two electrical explosions. Kurt Schilling pitched the first two innings, and when the game resumed the next day, Johnson took the mound and went on to strike out 16 in 7 innings. Technically the most strikeouts in a relief appearance, and as we'll find out later, this wouldn't be his only relief appearance that year. And his second half would be stronger than his first, as he led in the same categories once again with a 2.49 ERA, and he became the second pitcher in history to have twice as many strikeouts compared to his walks. The first had been done the year prior by his biggest challenger for most dominant pitcher in the game, El Pedro Martinez. He also joined Sandy Koufax in 1965 to strike out 300 more batters than he walked, as his 372 strikeouts gave him a 13.4 K per nine. The highest ever for a start in a full season at the time, until Garrett Cole broke it in 2019. And of course, he won his third straight Cy Young, winning over his teammate Kurt Schilling and bringing his Cy Young bonus to 2.5 million. And that brought things to the postseason, where Johnson hadn't been as dominant in comparison to his insane regular seasons. And that continued in his Game 2 start in the NLDS, in which he gave up three runs over eight. Not bad, but not enough, as he picked up his seventh straight playoff loss. The Diamondbacks were able to win the series, and things changed for him to start the NLCS, as he pitched a complete game shutout with 11 strikeouts. And with a 3-1 lead, he took them out in Game 5, where he gave up two earned runs with eight strikeouts in seven innings, as the Diamondbacks were able to close out the Braves to make the World Series in just their fourth year of existence. And on the biggest stage, Johnson rose to the occasion in Game 2, as he dominated the Yankees throwing a complete game shutout, giving up just three hits while striking out 11 the same stat line as his NLCS Game 1 start. And after suffering two of the most devastating losses in World Series history in Game 4 and 5, the Diamondbacks still had confidence with Johnson on the mound in Game 6. And after they scored 12 in the first three innings, 
it was over as Johnson pitched seven stretch-free innings, striking out seven while throwing 104 pitches. And that's important because the next night in Game 7, after Kurt Schilling surrendered the lead and Miguel Batista got an out, Johnson came in and faced four batters, with none reaching. And this was important when the Diamondbacks were able to come back from a one-run deficit, equivalent to 10 with Mariano Rivera on the mound, giving Johnson the win in Game 7. And in the series, he threw 17.1 innings, giving up two earned runs while striking out 19 and winning three games, giving him a share of the MVP trophy with Kurt Schilling. In a year where he made history in two starts, started the All-Star game, won his four Cy Young, won five playoff games, and the World Series. And what we remember most is him hitting a bird in spring training. And while 2001 would be his most notable season, his last Cy Young season may have been his best. He didn't start the All-Star game, but still had a 2.47 ERA at the break, as he was an All-Star for the ninth time. He was even better in the second half, lowering his ERA, as he averaged over 10 strikeouts a game in 121.1 innings in 16 starts that he won 12 of. He finished with his best ERA of the time at 2.32, as he set a career high in wins at 24, and led the league in strikeouts at 334, adding another season to his record of consecutive 300 strikeout seasons at 5, which gave him the pitching triple crown, and a year's 10.7 war was the highest of his career. And with these numbers, voters couldn't fall for voter fatigue, as for the first time, he was named the unanimous Cy Young winner. And when you have the top two vote-getters anchoring your rotation, it's easy to see how they built off the World Series to win 98 games and the NL West. But Johnson faced the Cardinals like he did in the NLDS the year prior and struggled again as the Cardinals took the series. And that would put an end to Johnson's four years of Cy Young seasons as 2003 would be injury-ridden. When thinking about the pitchers who were able to overcome the dominant offense brought along by the steroid era, the first one thought of is Pedro Martinez, and deservedly so, especially with his 2000 season. But Johnson was just as dominant in an era dominated by hitters. In the same time frame of the four years discussed, Johnson pitched almost 300 more innings than Pedro, mainly because of Pedro's injuries. And across the board, their numbers are very comparable, with Pedro's ERA being most notable, while Johnson's strikeout numbers being his most notable. And these two, in a sense, show the beauty of pitching, as one guy who's 5'10", and one guy who is a foot taller, can be dominant in an era of pure power. And a point you can make that makes this more impressive for Johnson is the age factor. Without any knowledge, you would assume his four straight Cy Youngs came in his late 20s, like Pedro in the time, but this came in his mid to late 30s, where he pitched at least 248 innings every year. And believe it or not, Johnson isn't the only pitcher to win four straight Cy Youngs, as Greg Maddox did from 1992 to 95, and the comparisons look a little similar to the ones with Pedro Martinez. And not that it makes much of a difference, but two of these seasons were shortened for Maddox in the time span. And another point already made is that these four seasons for Maddox came in his late 20s. Just bringing this up to show that Randy Johnson was simply a freak of nature. With the heavy workload at his age and lack of multiple serious arm injuries, we wonder what planet he came from. And you can almost say that without a tip from Nolan Ryan, Johnson may not have terrorized hitters like Ryan did back in his day. Two similar pitchers with a frightening presence, and one that led to the next. And one that is a co-conspirator of the killing of a bird. And you can watch my video about the first few years of the Diamondbacks to see how they became the fastest expansion team to win a World Series.